had residencies in Marbella, you've played at pool parties in Ibiza, you've done festivals like Creamfields, you've toured with some big artists. Been fortunate enough, DJ on the 50 Cent tour, support 50 Cent. Crazy. The likes of Mariah Carey, P Diddy, Trey Songz. So, so wait, let's bring that back. You played at P Diddy's party. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean... Every, everybody just, wanted to get into a P Diddy party. You actually worked for none other than Simon Cow. No, right. Yeah. I rang up a few record labels and whatever, and my friend Swing, at the time, he was working at BMG, RCA. He said, look, I can't pay you no money, but what I can do is I'll cover your travel and I'll give you scrambled egg and beans and toast <laughs> every lunchtime. Like, mate, how can I refuse that? I love scrambled egg and beans. <laughs> like, that's a dream come true to me. Mr. DJ Colin Francis, welcome to the show. Yo. Um, it's fitting to have you as the first guest, a very good friend of mine. I've known you for close to 10 years now. Um, and you've almost had a number one album for every year that I've known you. That's nine consecutive <laughs> number ones. Um, it's crazy when you say it like that. <laughs> yeah. For everyone just tuning in, um, this is actually our second take because the lights just cut out in my studio. So <laughs> it's a really good start to the podcast series. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Mr. Colin Francis. So I reached out to you a couple of weeks ago. Um, obviously, the message at the moment for people in the hospitality and creative industry is this whole idea of retraining and reskilling and Basically, we're not getting that encouragement to to take up the arts. And as we know, we've both carved out a career in music. And I think it's really important that we start inspiring this younger generation to say, well, you know what? If you want to be a singer, be a singer. If you want to be a DJ, be a DJ. There's obviously still a career to be made in this. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to reach out to a few of my friends and different people in the industry. And you were first on the list. So uh, welcome to the studio, bro. <laughs> it's an honor. It's an absolute honor. So obviously you well had a love of music from a young age. So yeah. Where did that all kind of start for you? It kind of started for me with like my parents always having music on in the house, always. It was, I mean, I think for us growing up um, as a family, music was always something which was at the forefront. Um, I couldn't, for as long as I can remember, whoever house it was that I was in, whether it was at my house, whether it was at my grandparents' house, my uncles, my aunts, there was always records. Somebody had records in the house, standard. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it was just a case of, you'd sit there and while you're listening to the music, I always used to pick up the sleeves and be looking at the back of the sleeve and finding out who wrote the song, who produced the song, who played the drums, who played the keyboards, who co-produced it, who was the executive producer. So I'm a bit nerdy like that. You know, I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to those sort of things. So I always, as well as listening to the music, I had a insight as to what actually was going on in the background and that's what I wanted to that's what I really wanted to explore and so I used to do that from a young age and who, who were some of those early influences on you in terms of like records for yeah. like obviously putting you on the spot but like no, that, them early names the early names for me um would be the likes of Stevie Wonder um it would be the likes of Michael Jackson um you know, my, my dad was a massive Otis Redding fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sitting on the dock of the bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'd look on the back of the credits there. But then, again, like for me personally, is that I really started sort of taking more note as to the production side of it with regards to the likes of Teddy Riley, the New Jack Swing era and that sort of thing, you know. Um, that was when I really started getting into the whole background of it with Albie Shaw, um, Quincy Jones, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, obviously from a lot of that spawned the likes of your Pharrell's, your Timberlands, your Devontae Swings. Your modern day producers, yep, yep, yeah, and yep, I hear. Yeah. It's it's interesting you say that because a lot of people say to me about how did how and why did I first mm -hmm. pick up a saxophone and yeah. 
it does start at that early age. And this is why I always yeah. say to people um, who've got younger kids who they, they say, oh, well, I really want to get my kid into playing an instrument or something. I say, it's literally exactly what you just said, Colin. By playing good music, all kinds of genres, mm -hmm. just yeah. sh like letting them experience different sounds, that instills that early thought process where they, they start thinking critically about music and, oh, I like that track. I, oh, I like the drums on this. And that's where it all started for me as well. So 100%. that is, I, I suppose, the, I guess, on the early part of any DJ's career, it starts yeah. listening to good music. Yeah. Obviously, you're a open format DJ now. Mm -hmm. You can play house, you can play R&B, you can play at parties around the world and yeah. known for those kind of energetic sets. But mm -hmm. as you said, it all comes from a love of music from different Million genres, percent. right? So, And that was always a key for for me in our household is that it was an array of music, what we was listening to. You know, we'd be listening to everything from, as I say, Michael Jackson, but to Phil Collins, to David Bowie, to Diana Ross, to, you know, um, Madness. Yes, yeah, so a real eclectic mix of music, basically. Yeah, and uh, producers like Kraftwerk, uh, Jean-Michel Jarre, you know, all these kind of, you know, so you had the electronica sound as well as, you know, the R&B sounds. Then obviously then coming through and then having like things like with the hip hop. So listening to people like, you know, Public Enemy, um, Flavor Flav and uh, Africa Bambata and, you know, as I say, just really sort of, you know, Big Daddy Kane, just listening to a whole range of just different artists, which again became, it became, at the time, you didn't realize that hip hop R&B was going to be, R&B as we know it, so to speak, you know, was going to be as influential as what it was, because that was, quite a a minority music like a specialist music what they used to call it back in the day you know it's uh you know you, you had specialist radio stations it wasn't commercial mainstream you know even in the club scene it's not mainstream now what we would regard as specialist music is actually mainstream now yeah of it's course, actually yeah. the modern day pop you know D dedicated radio stations yeah yeah and that, where you would only hear the likes of like grime tunes, that sort of thing, would not even make it anywhere now, near a radio right at playlist. the forefront of the UK scene. Of course, so. but now it's you know people like Stormzy, and uh, number one in in the charts, and you know Skepta, and you know all these different artists. You know, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's amazing to see. I love it. Yeah, no, that's wicked. It's it's good to see that. Obviously, such an eclectic taste in music yeah. has ended up with you becoming a DJ. And obviously, yeah. it, it started at a young age. And then I'm right in thinking that your uncle kind of introduced you to the oh, idea yeah. of DJ yeah. Dex. Yeah, yeah. He was he was kind of, I suppose, the first sort of influence. Uh, name check, Greg. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> Shout I out, think, Greg. Yeah, I, I don't, I've name checked him on um, a few of the albums, like in the credits, but I don't think I've actually ever name name checked him on a, a podcast <laughs> or an interview. So, Greg, you know this one's for you. Uh, um, it, yeah, but Greg used to have collect loads and loads and loads of records, and it's funny because when I tell you his record collection was something which I didn't ever think I'd be able to top. Like it was an unthinkable task. And I remember there being a point when I got to maybe around, I don't know, maybe around my early 20s. And I thought, I think I've actually passed the amount of records that you've actually got now. <laughs> Which, <laughs> thinking obviously from when I was like the age of yeah, crazy. 10, 11, and I'm seeing how many like rows and rows and rows of records and I'm thinking, I mean, he must have had at least 2,000 records, I'd say, at least. And then for me to then look at my collection and think I've actually surpassed his almost double was just an amazing feat because I always looked at his collection as like the mecca. 
Yeah. You know? um, <laughs> but again, he was always across across the board. And that was, I suppose, where my initial influence came in with listening to different things. And he'd listen to things like um, a, a guy called Steve Arrett and uh, he'd done a track called Just a Touch of Love. Um, he come from a group called, a, a band called Slave. Um, which had some amazing music. Then he had things like Loose Ends, you know, um, and then other artists like um, bands like uh, Roger Troutman from Zap Band. I remember those. I, I'm going back now. I'm, I'm just <laughs> reciting some of these images in my head. Um, no, it's, it's good to re it's good to relive the 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 childhood memories yeah, of those like, those tracks that have got you to where you are you don't usually today. challenge those those yeah, thoughts and, you, and, and go think, back there oh, you that know what one, I mean oh, that, oh, yeah. I mean that must be a, a good part of DJing actually is yeah. is when you're performing to a crowd and you know you've got them tunes in your locker yeah and you DJ off USB right so, yeah correct so for any aspiring DJ there's kind of well of, of the modern format yeah. so to speak yeah playing in a club with with decks, there's kind of two options that you can kind of go down. These days, rather than carrying a crate load of vinyl to a club Correct. or CDs, even CDs to Correct. a club, you can come with a USB, USB that's got playlists on it that you yeah. put together, yeah. all different genres, and you can kind of go through your whole catalogue, literally there and then on the screen. Correct. Or, of course, you've got the, the laptop method where, mm -hmm. again, same principle, plugs into the decks and you've got your whole music collection in front of you mm -hmm. and you can kind of select what tune you want and search for your, and that that whole catalogue. I mean, do you get that now where you're, you're performing live? Do you go in kind of pre-planning your sets or do you just, what would be your advice for an aspiring DJ who's got his first gig, he's turned up, he's got all his music on his USBs. Uh -huh. What's the plan of attack? Do you go in with a okay. idea or? So let me just be completely honest here and go like, from the get-go. When I very first started DJing, I used to go with a preset set, so to speak. I knew what song mixed into what, what went well, and that was it. And pretty much that was, whether the crowd liked it or not, that was going to be the mix because I knew it sounded good and that's what I practiced and that what I was, that's what I was comfortable with. And, you know, like, in order to get your confidence, you want to obviously make sure you sound right first and foremost. Course, yeah. And initially, and I say this to any aspiring DJ, is initially confidence is king. You need to build that confidence. So if you're going and you're mixing and you're starting to clang, which is a terminology for, you know, your mix not being tight and not in sync. Yeah. Um, so, so let's, let's break that down for... Yeah any aspiring potential DJ listening, uh -huh. going back to the very core basics of what a DJ actually does. Obviously, you, you're, the idea of mixing two tunes together, in theory, that is effectively matching the timing of the tracks. Correct. So that when, basically there's a... Seamless. A, yeah, that's it. There's a term called BPM, which is beats per minute, that mm -hmm. determines how quick a track is. Mm -hmm. So if you get those BPMs to match and the structure of the songs to match, yeah. that's when you get a seamless mix. Correct. But obviously, when I first started, there was no visual BPM. Yeah. Your BPM was in your ears. Yeah. So, you know, you had to, everything was audio. There was no visual, no screens, no... Acting off instinct, listening to yeah, the tracks. Yeah, just, just having yeah. to feel it through, through you know, your, you know, your, your ears and, and just like feel the vinyl, feel the track slow it down, speed it up. Um, but the key thing really for for me was that when it came to, you know, performing in front of people, I wanted to be confident. Confidence was key. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would go there and I would have like my set already kind of pre-done. I'd have mixes which was already preset and everything, you know, that I was confident that I knew I could pull off. You know, bring the track in at this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 without a doubt. Yeah. Um, 
So that's obviously a, a great starting point. That's for a, a great starting point. Because don't forget, you kind of know what songs sound good. Yeah, yeah. And I always try to envisage the fact of me, if I was on a dance floor, what would I be doing? So even though I'm DJing, I still try and envisage myself being on the dance floor and try and understand what emotion I'm trying to evoke for the person which is standing on the dance floor. Yeah. And if I'm getting excited behind the decks, I'd like to think that it's getting them excited. <laughs> yeah. And and that is on that, the other side that of is decks. that core principle of a DJ, isn't of it? Of course it is. A DJ's of course job, it is. so to speak. But of course it is. To make people dance. To make people dance yeah. and to enjoy themselves. Create emotion within the audience, hundred percent. Million percent. So um yeah, initially it was that, but now nowadays, you know, where I have that confidence of knowing that I can be given any tunes and I can put any songs together um, within reason, of course. <laughs> um, you know, that, you know, I can, again, with the depth of knowledge musically as well, is that I can now just go and just read a crowd and, yeah, so you I, know, be able to sort of... So this is the interesting mm -hmm. point to be to be gained out of this is as a DJ, that is the most important part of your job really. Yeah. Is this idea of reading a crowd is looking at the, how the crowd's reacting to your music. Yeah. Whether it needs that little injection of energy, whether you need to flip up and change the genre, so yeah. to speak. And we get a lot of that at the weddings that, that we do. Yeah. Because you've got such a diverse audience. Yeah. You can have younger kids there, you can have your 20s to 30s and then you've got the mums and dads and granddads but yeah. what we found and what you can vouch for as well is that good music is good music and yeah. it's timeless yeah so 100%. when you're going back to your 70s 80s tracks your mm -hmm. motown like you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. a lot of these tracks actually influence a lot of the current dance music a million percent when you look at the dance charts now uh there's a lot of sampling going on from vocals from bass lines, mm -hmm. the little riffs, mm -hmm. and you start to pick it up, especially as a DJ, where mm -hmm. you go, hold on, I know that bass line, that's yeah. been taken, and yeah. that whole thought process behind it, you realise that that's a massive part of music is of course. recreating. and Of course, and as we know, life is a cycle, and generations pretty much repeat, and, you know, the older you get, the more you kind of appreciate that. You know, things which you would probably find yourself hearing from your parents, you find that you start repeating yourself later on down the line. You know, you always get that classic line of, I was young once, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. When you're actually the person which is growing up, you actually think you're the first to do it. And oh, it yeah, that, yeah, you yeah. Know, and that, you know best than everything else, but it's oh, like, don't. When I, when I first picked up a saxophone, yeah, I did not want to practice. Uh -huh. I hated it. Yeah, I used to get uh, taken to lessons on a Saturday morning. I used to think there's nothing that I would rather be yeah. doing. Like it's, it's just this is yeah. not me. Yeah. I don't want to do it for whatever reason. My mum and dad said, "Listen, you're not quitting. Yeah. You'll practice. Yeah. You'll get it right." And it comes back to that. Like, that old saying, practice makes perfect, mm -hmm. but it's so true for musicians. Same for DJs. Yeah. You practice your set, you practice yeah. your craft. Yeah. And then one day, like fortunately for me, it did. After a lot of practice, I wasn't naturally gifted as a musician. Mm -hmm. Some people have got an amazing voice mm -hmm. and can sing from the mm -hmm. from the moment they're, they're born. You know what I mean? Well, mm -hmm. can talk. And um, for me, it was just hard work. That's yeah. all it was. Yeah. And then when that day does come and it clicks, Yeah. All of a sudden, everything else starts to fall in place. And like yeah. you said, when you you start to appreciate music and yeah. think about music and how it how it makes you feel and yeah. everything else, and then how it then affects the dance floor and how what I found now, especially at gigs, is going back to this idea: if if music is good, even if someone hasn't heard it, but it's got that catchy riff, it's got that. That's right. You can make a dance floor dance. That's right. Without them having ever heard the song before. That's right. And a lot of that comes from you and doing your your studying behind the scenes and a hundred percent but also i think that you know i also 
I was always a DJ, which I didn't want to just play what the charts or the radio, so to speak, mm -hmm. was dictating to play because there was tracks which I knew, which were album tracks, which wasn't necessarily the single, but they were on the album and the record label didn't have the insight to really say, this is the one. Yeah. But everybody else was like, this is the one. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So then when you go into a club and you play it in a club, that actually is getting a bigger reaction than the track which is actually in the charts. Because, like I say, me music's a feeling. You can't say that the person at a record label or a radio station is going to dictate to you as to what feeling it, a song's going to evoke in you. Like, that's not their job. They like to think that it's their job, but it's not really. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, so, you know, the the thing for me was always whenever I was playing, is try and just pick the tracks which I knew people would enjoy and what they'd feel. And, you know, and the later that I went on with my DJing career is that you go in and you'll dig tracks out, which you knew would evoke a certain emotion in people, which are like, I've not heard that again for a long time or whatever it is. And it's so key. It's so key because music is such a thing where it's, it's just, if you get it right, it's the it's the best feeling you can create in somebody, you know. Yeah, no, it really, really is. It just it touches the soul, literally. Yeah, you know? I hear the adrenaline of making a a dance floor react to yeah. one of the tracks you've dropped, or yeah. react to yeah. your your jingle that we all know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you get all of that at the same time. Like it's just it's just an unbelievable feeling. You know, it's um, it's it's like, you know, giving a speech and then you hit that, or being a comedian, you hit that punchline and everybody starts clapping or everybody starts cheering, everybody starts laughing. Mm -hmm. It's like when you drop that tune in a club and everybody at the same time puts their hands up or roars or you, you know, as a DJ, no matter how busy somewhere is, you'd always hear that, you know, <laughs> you want to hear that roar when yeah. you drop the tune and they're like, yes, yeah. you know, that's what you live for when you're DJing. Yeah, you definitely. Know? Nobody wants to DJ and hear a, a deadpan <laughs> quiet and people well, just looking at you while you're DJing. Do you know what I mean? That's, like, that's a really important point, actually. And it, it kind of sums up what this podcast is about. Mm -hmm. When you start off as a DJ, forget the career side of things. It's about the passion for the music oh, and getting doubt. the reaction of people. Always. It's only at a later stage that actually, okay, you think I can monetize this mm -hmm. and this becomes a, becomes my job. And mm -hmm. obviously we're in a strange time at the moment, but you managed to carve out a very successful career playing all over the world. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about this idea of, because we, we've spoken about practicing, building your music collection, mm -hmm. but, finding good music and good artists that you know are going to make people dance. Mm -hmm. A very important part of becoming a DJ, especially in this uh, climate, mm -hmm. is the idea of a, a brand and mm -hmm. creating a brand and mm -hmm. a business behind it that people can relate to and follow the journey of. We live in a era now where through social media, as, yeah. as much as it has its flaws, yeah, we can get our con content out to all corners of the earth. We can... Mm -hmm. be putting videos up we can be putting mixes out we can have our own website facebook marketing wh whatever you want to go down it but mm -hmm. let's take it back to the early days of you becoming a dj yeah. and because you had this idea of creating a brand yeah so to speak from early and that's what's propelled you to mm -hmm. the heights that you're at now really mm -hmm. so stripping that back mm -hmm. how did you go about creating this brand to begin with well first and foremost when you're creating a brand, you got to think about yourself and your identity and what you stand for. And that goes across anything, whether it be food, whether it be um, a clove, clothing company, 
is that same thing with DJing is that your brand is what you represent, what you stand for. And, you know, you want that to be synonymous along the way. So as a DJ, you want people to think of good music and good times when they think of you. And that is the key to, in, in my eyes, as uh, a good DJ, mm -hmm. is when you think of a DJ and as soon as you hear the name, you associate a good time with that DJ. Good mix is a good feeling. So talking of mixes, mm -hmm. you were one of the early pioneers of mix CDs, right? Right. And, and giving out free mix CDs. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. Now, it's, it's yeah. actually quite mad because obviously before the Ministry of Sound compilations come out, yeah. In the big time, it's, it's mad because I've actually got a couple of your CDs here. No way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so me and Carl have known each other for about 10 years now. Um, you can probably see on screen here, I've got the uh, DJ Colin Francis, London celebrity DJ, the No Cars Before Marv's 2012 <laughs> official mix. I mean, wow. it's, it's taken a bit of a battering. I think the... Uh, the I think the, it's held up yeah, quite well, the, to be it's, fair. It's held up well. The branding yeah. on it's gone a bit smudged. It's probably some kind of yeah. champagne pie or I got thrown <laughs> in the pool or something. And then I've got actually another one here. Um, Danny Welbeck, a.k.a. Welbeck's 21st birthday party mix. Wow, Welbeck's is 21st so, birthday. Welbeck's is 21st. Wow. That is going back a little while now. Um, so. You'd have to give those to me. I don't even think I've got a copy of those myself. But. Yeah, I, I have to burn you a copy of it. <laughs> small, small charts at the moment because you're not doing no work, so I'm going yeah, to monetize yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, so love not, that, love that. Not sure I've uh, yeah, 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 had yeah. the royalties for that, though. Yeah. But, um, yeah. <laughs> so, oh. so, Cole, when I first met you, really, must have been um, Marbella times, right? Probably yeah, going back. probably, yeah. 2011, 2012, something yeah, like about that. Yeah, that sort of Around time. that kind of time. Yeah. Obviously, I was fresh on the scene. Um, and one thing which always stuck with me, which is a huge part of, I think, the whole branding in itself, mm -hmm. is the fact that you make time to talk to everyone mm -hmm. in that party. When I tell you I've left clubs with you, <laughs> <I'll tell> you <laughs> going, going back to like, I don't know, one on five days and when we used to play in West End, Maybe Cole be dropping me home and I'll be like, come Cole, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll just say bye to a few people. Bro, it would have taken us about an hour and 20 minutes to leave the club because this guy will sit there. Yeah, all right, Sanjay, all right, darling, yeah, yeah. Uh, nice to see you. All right, Dave, yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks for coming. You, you know everybody. Mm. How'd you do it? <laughs> you know what? It's so, so weird because you don't really realise that you're doing it until <laughs> other people actually point it out and you know you're not the first <laughs> and you certainly won't be the last to say that but it's um I think that personable touch is so integral for me and for what I'm about and it is who I am you know is that just in general I'm a giving person and I, I like to you know I, I like to make people feel good man do you know what I mean and it's uh it's part of it. And I think that the least that you can do is after they've given you, whether it be an hour or two hours of their time for you, the least I could do is spend five minutes with them. Yeah, no, I hear that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they've just given me two hours of their time solidly or an hour of their time solidly and gave me all of their energy and everything else. So when I come off the decks and either they want to say, you know, six set or whatever it is, well, the least I could do is just, you know, have five minutes with them and, you know, or a couple of minutes or whatever 100%. and just say, you know, thanks or blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a lot of the time, as this will do now, people want to know the man behind the music. Oh, yeah, you know? 100%. Um, and I think a lot of DJs miss that in the sense of, they almost want to put themselves on a certain hierarchy platform and sort of be the big I am. Get and, to, get too caught up in this yeah, idea of too, being a superstar DJ. When it's like, I always call it the Clark Kent event, uh, the Clark Kent effect is that, you know, for me, the Clark Kent effect is when I'm on the decks, I am Superman. But as soon as I come off the decks, I'm back to, you know, the nerdy 
Clark Kent <laughs> and just the normal regular guy, you know? When I'm on the decks, I'm in my own zone, I'm I'm doing my thing. When I come off the decks, I'm just being back to Colin, not DJ Colin Francis. Yeah, hundred percent. And I I'm sure by having that amazing trait where you build these connections with people who come to see you play and dance yeah. to your music, yeah. that translates to people wanting to support and buy your music and, att and attend your events because if you're a down-to-earth nice guy, yeah. we've had this conversation many times before, big part of it, hard work, mm -hmm. second part, talent, the third part is just being a good person, million being a percent. nice person that people can connect with and talk yeah. to. million percent. Because especially in the music industry, it can be cutthroat at times. Yeah. But let me tell you, DJs especially, and musicians, if you're a relatable guy oh. and you can talk to people, oh, that will stand you in oh, much no, no, better stead than having a bad attitude and thinking you're a superstar it's way a, before your time. Again, like I say, the nerdy side of me and the geeky side of me is that anybody which I know which is hugely successful and at the top of their game and have got more than anything longevity in their career, whoever I've met, they're good people. Bottom line. You get a lot of in this industry, million, but not a lot of them have a long career. You get some that might have a flash in the pan, sort of do well for a year, a couple of years or whatever, or have a great song and then their arrogance or whatever. So, but the ones which have had a long career and the ones which are highly respected and have a massive fo following and fan base and support are the good guys and the good girls. The, 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 the people which have a good persona. And for me, that always holds in good stead. You're not always going to guarantee that it's going to get reciprocated and it's going to come back. That's not a guarantee, but it doesn't matter because it doesn't change who you are and what you're about, you know, and you have to be consistent with that in the sense that just because somebody might not like what you do or what you play or whatever, it doesn't matter because for every one of those, there's a hundred others what will. So don't focus on the negative aspects. That's their loss. Focus on the positive. One million percent. Well, we'll probably put that at number one on our top 10 tips for aspiring DJs. First mm. of all, be yourself and be personable oh, yeah. and, and, and build your connection yeah. with the people who come to listen to you and dance. Mil million percent, 100%. million percent. You know, humble humbleness is real key in anything what you do. You know, I always say to people, the only difference between me and you is the fact that, you know, I play music and I happen to be all right at it. You know what I mean? But in your field, whatever it is what you do, you know, I'm humbled by what it is what you do. Because as long as you've got a passion about something, then you're successful in my eyes. You know, it's not about the monetary side of it, of how much money you earn or whatever. It's whether you're able to do something what you love, whether it be working with a charity, whether it be giving to people, being a carer, whatever it is, if you're giving something positive back to the universe, that to me is a good sign. You know, that's Yeah, key. no, I hear you there. I hear you there. And it all comes back to this point we made originally about why you should still aspire to be a DJ or to be a musician. The very start, it's never about the money. Never. It's never about the fame. Never. It's never about any of this stuff. But if you've no. got a passion for music and you can see how that translates to people and the emotions that it can have on people, mm -hmm. how it can take you back to that Changes moment. people's lives. How it can lift you to that Changes next place. Changes people's lives. A million percent. You know, I've had people percent. come up to me and just say, you know, that it's funny, just literally the other day went into the hairdressers and um, there was a guy which just randomly came in and just said, oh, you know what? Uh, I thought it was you. Um, I just want to say that you inspired me to become a DJ. That's one of the best, and biggest compliments that you can ever get is that you can inspire somebody to want to do, follow their dreams and follow their goals, you know? And 
that was me at one point, you know, and, you know, my aspirational levels came from seeing the work ethic amongst my family and then on from that, artists and musicians seeing what they've achieved and just saying, okay, I want to be able to reproduce that energy with my skill. I hear you there, bro. Anyway, so let's move on to some of those crazy parties that you've played out over the mm -hmm. years. As I said earlier, the original celebrity DJ in London, you have gone from playing records in your uncle's bedroom to some of the biggest stages on the world. Wow. You've had residencies in Marbella. You've played at pool parties in Ibiza. You've done festivals like Creamfields. You've toured with some big artists. I mean, what guys have you played with on tour? Um, well, been fortunate enough um, through relationships which I, I have to be able to uh, DJ on the 50 Cent tour, support 50 Cent. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. What what, uh, what venues did you play with 50? Oh, man, it was all of like, so we went everywhere from the O2 in London um, to arena in... On, only the O2, by the way, only the uh, <laughs> <laughs> the biggest arena in yeah. the capital. So yeah. craziness. It's, what's what's know, he like as a person? Very humble. I know yeah. obviously like what you might see on... Social media is, you know. It's part of the the persona, yeah. Yeah, but he's just driven. He's driven, as you would imagine. Um, and, you know, it's, like I say, it's not by coincidence as to why he's as successful as what he is, you know. He understands his game. He understands what it is to, to have a certain work ethic, to be solely focused on achieving greatness. You know, yeah. and as I say, all that, that kind that's, of that's translated as well. Where he's then diversified and gone of off course. to have other successful business yeah. ventures, yeah. Um, and of course, involved with the show of power, yeah. Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's it crazy. goes on, but yeah, I mean, from you know, from him to real early on in my career, the likes of Mariah Carey, um, likes of Pharrell Williams. Um, P. Diddy, um, wow, Trey Songs. So, wait, let's bring that back. You've played at P. Diddy's party, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that guest list must have been everybody wanted something to get in, different. Every, everybody Just... wanted to get into a P. Diddy party because he, he is arguably one of the best to do it when it comes to throwing a party. Even now, hands down, um, and to be able to do that in the heart of my city, the West End, phenomenal, phenomenal. Like again, the guy is a showman, and he he just you know he he exuberates energy. Like when he's even just if he's not on the mic, which he always most of the time wants to be on the mic hosting the night and everything else, even when he's at his table, like, he'd buy champagne for everybody in the club. Everybody. Not missing one person. Champagne for everyone in the club. Come on, bro. <laughs> we're not talking about Prosecco. It's we're a talking level. about <laughs> We're talking about top drawer champagne. Um, <laughs> yeah, but just things like that, you know, forget things like that, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, it's, uh, again, it's, it's the, the whole thing of his brand and it's all synonymous with what he stands for and as to, you know, what you think of when you think of Diddy, you think of a great party guy, you think Going of a extra, guy yeah. which, you know, is extravagant and he is that larger than life character. So... Again, but you know, all these different people, what you kind of are around, you kind of take a little bit of them and you apply it into your own armory and create and build on your own brand and your own identity, you know, mm -hmm. because one thing's for sure is that you never stop learning. You know, you think that you might, you might know a lot, but you definitely don't know it all and you'll never know it all 
even till the day that you die. And the minute you think you do, you might as well call it a day, you know, because you can always learn, you know, of from whoever you're around, even if they're in different industries and, you know, different lines of work. Just just learn, learn from, from people. So putting you on the spot. Yeah. Fire them out. Top three craziest parties you've ever been to or played at. It really is on the spot. <laughs> um, well, obviously, needless to say, uh, P. Diddy's definitely one of them. Um, I would say uh, Pharrell Williams as well. Uh, again, just because at that time with like NERD, you know, it was so crazy that even the likes of, you know, your, your Prince Harry's and your Prince Williams wanted to be there and be part of it, you know, because of the the statue of, of the guy. And this was still quite early in his career, so to speak. Um, a third one, possibly pool parties in Marbella. It's like, hard to single one out, right? Yeah, it's hard to single one out. But just in general, I think just... Um, some of our early parties in my bear pool parties are just some of the most memorable experiences for me. Just great times. And I mean, we continue to go on and do them, but you know, those initial parties. Those glory years. Yeah. 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 yeah I yeah, mean, those, yeah. yeah, those pool parties at CSU, we've obviously I've played at them yeah, with you. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. They're the ones that kind of stick out in my million percent. That inspired career. so many of a generation with DJs, which are coming through now that, their whole aspiration level was, I want to DJ at, you know, Sisu or Unique Parties or whatever it is, or the Colin Francis project. Now that that was the aspirational point to say, I want to do that. Mm. And it's just nice to be able to be at the forefront of that to say, yeah, you know, and some amazing DJs have spawned from that as well, you know? So yeah, it's, some some great parties, great parties. Yes. I've gone but, from having a full schedule from middle of February booked all the way up to New Year's Eve to not working for nine months. Well, there you go. Nine yeah. months, crazy yeah. amount of time to not be doing yeah. something that you love doing. Oh, man. But yet the message still mm -hmm. for any aspiring musician or DJ yeah. is... Listen, oh, it, yeah, it's bad year, but you can't let that stop matter. you on on the path. Yeah, to get in to that next club, yeah, to yeah, that yeah. next booking, yeah. from yeah. picking up your first CD to yeah. playing your first festival. Mm -hmm. It's worth every second. Mm -hmm. And if you take a step back and say, you know what, it's not about the money, but these life experiences that I'm going to get, mm -hmm. you manifest yourself in just becoming the best DJ or musician you can be. Mm -hmm. It's all worth it because at mm. the end of that nine months or 10 months or whenever it is you next get to work after this crazy time, which I'm sure will not see repeated ever, hopefully, mm -hmm. to be told to reskill re and retrain, well, that's not an option for you because no. there's years of hard work and the process behind it, which has yeah. got you to where you are today. Yeah, a million percent. So what would your message be now for any person who's thinking, oh, do you know what? I I like the idea of becoming a DJ, but they're saying, well, I don't know, maybe there's not really a career to, to be had out of this because there isn't clubs open at the moment. Are we talking isn't... about with the current climate? As to what's yeah, with the or... current climate. So I'd you're, say... you're a young DJ now. Mm -hmm. You're thinking clubs are shut. We're not allowed to meet up. Mm -hmm. why, should I, why, why should I bother being a DJ? Mm -hmm. There ain't no long term in this. I'd say let... 2020 not define you but refine you you know um let it be something where it makes you have even more drive to say because we won't stay in this forever no, that's a 100%. fact it won't stay like this forever but use the time to really sort of practice maybe look at ways of when things do reopen that rather than when they reopen, you're trying to then get ready, be ready, 
for when it's open that you can just go straight off and you know listen don't don't let the media or anything of what you're hearing from the government deter you from what your aspiration and dreams are because you know i'm sure there's many a story as to what not just school teachers or what the institution or even sometimes your parents yourself even my parents to a certain degree told me that i had to have a certain amount of stability in my education before pursuing like my music and i listened but i didn't let it define me i still had my own dreams and aspirations and obviously now i can look back and you know i can say to my parents i can say to my teachers that yeah you know when obviously i was in school and you know you'd be digging me out for a year where you sit in there listening to your music or whatever the case is is not going to get you paid or get you a job what well, is actually getting me a better job than most of my peers what i went to school with and went into regular work so to speak and not only is that the case but i'm doing something which doesn't feel like work i'm loving what i'm doing every single day so it's in, it's important to keep those dreams and aspirations alive you have to don't let anybody kill that least of all the government you know and i want to actually take it back cuz i know when you first started out in the um in the music industry you went to uni yeah. you you kind of we're setting yourself up as a backup plan but always pursuing uh -huh. this idea of your following your dreams following uh -huh. your passion and you actually got some work experience right uh -huh. at a record label yeah and going back to this idea of the you've got the persona on one side uh -huh. the public image uh -huh. the the nasty bad boy image uh -huh. and then you've got the real life uh -huh. you actually worked for none other than Simon Cow no right yeah that was uh that was uh uh first and foremost i have to pay respects to one of my biggest influences not just in my career but in my life um uh brian daly aka dj swing um i owe so much to that man um god rest his soul he's passed away now uh fortunately uh due to cancer we lost him early but he helped me every step of my way of my career and as i say when i was at university i i had this dream of i understood music i understood what went on behind the production side of it I never understood the business side of it. And then I remember seeing like re re reading about again I used to read the background stories like what probably young kids would be doing with me now is that I used to do that with the likes of Diddy and whatever. Now I remember Diddy saying that he would get on a train which would be like other side of town to go to Uptown Records where Andre Harrell was the head of it to work for free just to get experience and be amongst those people and uh I thought yeah I like the sound of that so while I was at university I rang up a few record labels and whatever and my friend Swing at the time he was working at BMG RCA doing club promotions so i said i'll see if it would be possible for me to be able to get an assistant job there and uh yeah like i asked him he said look i can't pay you no money he goes but what i can do is i'll cover your travel and I'll give you scrambled egg and beans and toast <laughs> every lunchtime like 
and I was like, mate, how can I refuse that? I love scrambled egg and beans. <laughs> like, that's a dream come true to me. Like, and plus, obviously, I'm in the office and, you know, you're speaking to all the influential DJs at that time because you're sending them out records. So then when you're on the phone to them, you then start being able to make a connection with these people, which are your idols. Then you're starting to make connection with DJs all over the country. But then you're earning a level of respect by them DJs as well because you had your tastemakers who will get the records first, then you'll get your next list and then you'll get your next list, but you was always supplying them with the most upfront music. And I was in, like I say, in an office space with, you know, some phenomenal people. And, you know, one of them being Simon Cowell. And um, again, like, for me, I was just a young intern. So in terms of what he was to me when I'm seeing him, he was that guy which was like even then like oh my gosh, this and this is before the this is before, the TV shows yeah, before yeah, yeah. X Factor yeah. before everything else yeah. yeah but when somebody's got an aura and somebody's got a talent, it's never gonna be denied like it's it's impossible. At some point, it's gonna come through in its full glory. And we're talking now over 20 years ago and probably in the last, what, maybe six, seven years is when really people would have seen him at his pinnacle height, so to speak, in their eyes. But the guy's been a G from day one. Like, and uh, that also was another thing which seeing certain people in their careers and how time, the patience, patience is so key. People don't seem to realize it. Like the magic moment of standing at the top of the mountain with the flag and say, yeah, I'm here. is just a snapshot of what the whole journey was to get to the top of that mountain. And that journey is a hell of a lot longer than the trademark picture of standing there with the flag. It's a long time. It takes a long time. You have to have resilience. You have to have patience. You know, um, you might get a few stumbles along the way, but you have to be resilient. You have to. It's key. But if you do, you'll make it. That's great advice for anyone who's starting on this journey. Yeah. Dedication. Combine that with hard work combine that with being personable with people and building those relationships patience patience yeah yeah patience and you'll get where you where you'll get where you need to be yeah, yeah, yeah. you, you got to yeah. trust in the process yeah trust in that journey yeah and there's nothing to stop you from reaching those heights no and your yeah. your prime example Cole yeah from records in your uncle's yeah bedroom to number one albums yeah. And Adverts on TV, it's, festivals. Yeah, it's it's a long journey. It's a long journey. It's a long journey. But, but it's for worth every it. knockdown you've had from oh. every club booking that got cancelled here oh, or there, yeah, or yeah, messed yeah. around by this promoter, yeah, or yeah, yeah. arguing over this fee or that fee, or the long travels or the yeah. long nights, it put you on that path to where you are now. Yeah, a million percent. And you know, as I've said, is that your losses build character and your victories build confidence, you know, but you need both. And, you know, when you look at energy, you need negative and positive in order to arrive at that. You can't have two positives and you can't have two negatives. You've got to have one and the other. And it's key. The two go hand in hand. So don't ever let your negative aspects keep you down, let it propel you onto the positive things. A hundred percent. And for any aspiring DJ who's maybe only just started out, has just bought his first pair of mm -hmm. decks and is maybe getting that idea of a bit of stage fright about performing, in, mm -hmm. performing to a crowd 
or going to that club or messaging that promoter to say, look, can I have an opportunity mm -hmm. to do it? You're only ever going to get that experience of saying, you know what, that tune don't quite work or, you know what, that mix wasn't so tight. You're only ever going to learn and progress by taking those risks yeah, I mean, and, le and learning from them because, as you said, you can go play somewhere for free. Yeah, They can say no. Well, fair enough, they'll say no. But mm -hmm. you never know that one person might say yes and then you've got a captive audience where any number of opportunities could come from that, whether it's another booking, whether it's another party, whether, you know, the list, the list goes on. Absolutely. And there is not one single successful person that I know what has not been told no on many occasions in their life or even told you're not good enough or your idea's rubbish or it's never going to work. Nah. Or there's no jobs to it. be had. Not, this is it. Not any successful person that you can think of who you believe is successful has not been told at some point in their career and their journey, no, forget about it. You can't do that. Not one. So even when you hear this or you get told this, use that as the same negative energy to say, well, actually... I'm going to prove you wrong and I'm going to turn that negative into a positive. And the funny thing is that a lot of the naysayers, when you do make it, they're the ones that then go and say to, to their other people and their friends, I always knew he was going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it I've been that's there. The, that's the know. biggest compliment you can really yeah, get. Yeah, of course it is. Of course yeah. it is. But oh, I'll give him his first gig, that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Million percent, million yeah, percent. Brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Well, listen. Thanks for coming in. It's been a uh, it's been a pleasure. We've been talking for yeah for a long time. Hours. We won't say how long, but yeah, it's, we've it's been, been a long hours. Time. I mean, yeah. the edit you're going to hear on this podcast is a snippet of what it we've really done is. in today. But yeah. um, listen, there's going to be lots of fresh content coming out. Um, we're going to get Cole back in to do a live DJ set fresh from this same studio um, in a couple of weeks' time, which you can find the links to down below on this YouTube video. Yep. Um, so go check out that other content and hopefully by the time you're hearing this, there'll be a few more gigs that you can actually go see this man play at. But yeah. for the time being, go download his albums. There's nine number ones there that you can take <laughs> your pick from. The Ministry of Sound Compilations, yeah. Marbella Sessions. Yeah. This has been the man himself, DJ Colin Francis. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much, CJ.